Hey guys, back with another Fallout 4 video, and today I figure we could go ahead and talk about the origins of Deathclaws and try to figure out what types of animals Deathclaws most closely resemble from our real world. So I guess without further ado, let's discuss what we know about Deathclaws based on the accounts of a specific NPC named Joseph. According to Joseph from Fallout 2, he mentions that Deathclaws appear to be mutated Jackson's chameleons. In case you're curious about what a Jackson's chameleon looks like, like, it's basically a chameleon with three points on its head. One is located just above the chameleon's mouth, where you would expect an animal's nose to be, and the other two are located between the animal's eyes like horns. You may also be interested to know that the Jackson's chameleon is originally native to East Africa and is actually an alien species that does appear in parts of the United States in places like California and Hawaii. So this means that it's consistent with the first two Fallout games. It's important to mention that Joseph from Fallout 2 is a doctor that helps the Deathclaws that live in Vault 13 during the events of that game. Joseph mentions that he was gathering herbs one night when he heard a voice call out from the darkness that said, I've been watching you, and I know that you're a healer. Are you dedicated to your art enough to heal someone foreign to you? Someone whom many would consider an enemy. Ultimately, Joseph agreed to help, thinking that it was a raider that spoke to him. However, he was surprised when a couple of Deathclaws emerged, one which was injured, and upon saying that he couldn't treat the Deathclaw where they were, the Deathclaws blindfolded him and took him to Vault 13, where a pack of very intelligent Deathclaws resided. The pack of Deathclaws in Vault 13 are led by Gruthar and are a collection of Deathclaws that were originally captured and exposed to FEV by the Enclave. The FEV exposure allowed them to become more intelligent and gain the ability to speak. While spending time with Deathclaws in Vault 13, Joseph has learned quite a bit more about the species. Specifically, they don't seem to have vocal cords, however they are able to mimic human speech, much like a parrot. Deathclaws also travel together in packs, led by an Alpha Deathclaw, and all members of said pack are very loyal to the other members. Joseph also goes on to mention that Deathclaws appear to have a sense of right and wrong, and that the pack has a code of ethics that are strictly enforced. From the way Joseph describes them, the Deathclaws of Vault 13 appear to be relatively civilized amongst themselves and are a tight-knit group. Unfortunately, during the events of the game, Frank Horgan arrives and wiped out the Deathclaws at Vault 13. While if you escape, it's confirmed in the Fallout Bible that these few intelligent Deathclaws don't reproduce, and this explains why you don't really see talking Deathclaws in any of the future Fallout games. What I think we can say for sure is that over time, Deathclaws have become more prominent throughout the Wasteland. Originally, Deathclaws were only found in the Boneyard from Fallout 1, however they've since spread across the United States, appearing in places as far away as Boston, as seen in Fallout 4, and the Capital Wasteland as seen in Fallout 3. In Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3 to some extent, Deathclaws tend to congregate together. This is what makes places like Quarry Junction from New Vegas and Old Ohlone from Fallout 3 so dangerous, and this is because you're dealing with not just one or two powerful enemies, but sometimes five or more. Interestingly, Deathclaws at least appear to be more isolated in Fallout 4 and don't travel in these types of packs. I suppose a great example of that is at the very beginning of the game where you encounter the Deathclaw at Concord. And you can also encounter Deathclaws in the Glowing Sea, and you will rarely if ever find yourself fighting more than just one. Granted, there are locations in the Glowing Sea where you can fight a few Deathclaws in close proximity, however for the most part, Deathclaws tend to be restricted to one-on-one -on -one confrontations. We've also seen the domestication of Deathclaws across the various games. Of course, the Enclave has performed experiments on Deathclaws quite a bit, as seen in both Fallout 2 and in Fallout 3. The reformed Enclave from Fallout 3 have created devices that they place on the heads of Deathclaws in an attempt to control them, and this seems to have had some successes, however Deathclaws can still prove to be difficult for the Enclave to control. What seems to be the most successful domestication of Deathclaws is seen in Fallout 4's Wasteland Workshop DLC. Not only can the sole survivor capture Deathclaws, but through a beta wave emitter, they can use Deathclaws to defend settlements. This is actually fairly impressive when you consider how the Enclave struggled with this sort of technology so much in the past. Something that's worth mentioning is that Joseph's initial estimate that Deathclaws may have descended or mutated from Jackson's chameleons may be wrong. On the one hand, while Jackson 
Jackson's chameleons appear as an alien species in parts of California, it's worth mentioning that Jackson's chameleons don't lay eggs where death claws do. Instead, the Jackson's chameleon actually gives birth to live offspring. Granted, it's worth mentioning that most other chameleons do lay eggs, and perhaps the pre-war government genetically modified a Jackson's chameleon to lay eggs. Even still, that doesn't really explain the lack of a third horn on death claws that's prominently seen on the Jackson's chameleon. Also, both male and female death claws have horns, while female Jackson's chameleons don't have horns. You also have to consider that the Deathclaw is named as such because it attacks with its own claws, and in contrast, the Jackson's Chameleon hunts its prey by using its tongue. And at the very least, significant genetic manipulation would have to occur to go from a Jackson's Chameleon to a Deathclaw. Deathclaws are predators, while chameleons tend to prey on insects and worms, and are themselves prey for birds and snakes. While there are some lizards, like frilled lizards, which can exhibit bipedal motion while moving at higher speeds, deathclaws as seen in the game walk upright in a fashion that's similar to birds or primates. And in a certain sense, deathclaws are somewhat reminiscent of dinosaurs like T-Rex in the sense that they can move bipedally and use their tail for balance. At the same time, most dinosaurs didn't have gigantic claws for hands, like we see on death claws. That, and you will frequently see in Fallout 4, death claws can exhibit quadrupedal motion that's reminiscent of something that you might see in a lion, panther, or jaguar. However, unlike a lion, which would probably bite its prey, the death claw can primarily attack with its claws. But I'm sure you're all probably wondering, what is a death claw? Well, if I had to pick an animal from the real world that more or less resembles a deathclaw or would serve as a template for further genetic manipulation, I would pick the iguana or other similar lizards. While Joseph from Fallout 2 thinks that deathclaws evolved from the Jackson's chameleon, the only thing the Jackson's chameleon has in common with the deathclaw is its horns. I suppose to be fair, the Deathclaw itself is a heavily modified lizard that may contain genetic traits that resemble the iguana, Jackson's chameleon, and several other lizards, as well as even some non-lizard animals. My thinking, though, is that iguanas may have been quite common in pet stores before the Great War, sort of like red scorpions, which are said to be the descendants of emperor scorpions, which we definitely do know were sold in pet stores, according to a terminal entry located in Tenpenny Tower in Fallout 3. It's possible that because the iguana was relatively common in the pre-war era, that the United States military used them as a base for their experimentation while trying to develop creatures for close combat. Over time, the American military would modify the iguana by mixing various genes together, making the creature a little larger and far more aggressive. Perhaps the military's thinking was to create a creature that had the characteristics of an invasive species, which would not only greatly affect the environment, but would also be aggressive enough to attack the local population. Either that, or maybe it was designed to be an animal that was easier to train and would also be stronger than your average dog. Then, these modified lizards would be deployed to a combat zone and would attack all enemy targets. After the Great War, perhaps the Master got his hands on this modified combat lizard DNA at the Mariposa military base, he refined it, and turned it into the Death Claws that we all know. Perhaps certain features of Death Claws, like the horns and claws, are the result of the Master's refinements to the original pre-war combat lizard's DNA. However, there is one creature from Fantasy and Dungeons and Dragons that does appear to resemble the Death Claw the best, and that is something called the Tarrasque. In D&D, the Tarrasque is supposed to be this 50-foot-tall T-Rex-like monster that is supposed to be extremely powerful and has a chance of killing the various players and possibly other creatures in a game. If you look at a lot of artists' depictions of the Tarrasque, it sort of looks like a Deathclaw does, complete with two massive horns on its head, a back and tail covered in massive horns, and the Tarrasque can also have giant claws. It's also important to mention that Scott Campbell, who is one of the masterminds behind the original Fallout game, has stated that his original design for a Deathclaw was to have it be more like a mix of a wolverine and a brown bear that's mutated by FEV. However, Scott received feedback on his original design and was told that the Deathclaw had too much hair and as a result, the initial design was scrapped. However, what would ultimately become the design for the Deathclaw was actually an asset for a creature that was supposed to appear in Planescape Torment. 
For whatever reason, it was decided that the Tarask like creature wouldn't make it into Planescape, and with that particular asset or 3D model free, Scott ultimately decided to borrow it and use it as his design for the Deathclaw. After all, the Tarask was a design that sort of looked like the original Deathclaw design, however without the hair. A theory as to why the Deathclaw lost its hair was due to the limitations of rendering software at the time. It would be a lot harder to animate all of that hair and make it look good. In fact, even for modern games, hair is a very difficult thing to design and animate so that it looks natural. After all, you have to account for things like how hair looks when it blows in the wind, among other things. In fact, if the Deathclaw maintained its original design, I would say that it would be a lot easier to trace the base or core animal that it's based on, as Scott's design looks sort of like a wolf mixed with the bear. Ultimately, Deathclaws would have to have had some kind of lizard as a template. Over time, whatever the American military created from before the war has been constantly modified and refined by various people like the Enclave, Master, and perhaps other factions that we are not yet aware of. But alright guys, I think that's going to wrap up this particular video. If you like this video, please be sure to leave a like, click the bell to join the notification squad, and as always, take care, and I'll see y'all next time.